Good evening. It's a pleasure to be with you again today and to open up the Word of God and study with you once more. In Psalm 24, in Psalm 24, as we read at the beginning of our service, Psalm 24 and verse 3, the Bible simply says this, "...who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, and who may stand in His holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood, and has not sworn deceitfully." Last week in Houston, one of the petrochemical plants that were there had a fire break out in it, on its property. Somehow, a drop in water pressure ignited a blaze in this plant, and that fire that you see behind me burned for three days. Of course, the big story behind that disaster was not, was not the, uh, the fire itself, and it wasn't any fatalities that came from the fire. There were, there were none that were seriously injured from this incident that occurred at the plant. The big story wasn't the fire. The big story actually was the huge plume of black smoke that ascended up from the fire. Seeing as this was a petrochemical plant and the chemicals that were being burnt by that fire were ascending into the atmosphere were of a, were of a very toxic nature. That big black cloud of smoke that you see was full of irritating, dangerous, and cancer-causing materials. And so dangerous, so dangerous was this cloud of smoke at the city of Deer Park, Texas, which is actually where that plant is located. Deer Park, Texas issued a shelter-in-place warning. And they told all of their residents, the schools are closed, you need to shelter in place, stay inside your house, and put towels in, beneath, in, in, in between the gaps in your doorways to make sure that these chemicals can't get inside your home. That's how dangerous these chemicals were. And so naturally, these guys decided to hit some golf balls. Only in Texas. Isn't that a terrifying thing? How do you live in an environment where the very air you breathe is full of poison without being affected by the poison. And when I think about that, that fire that broke out in that petrochemical plant, I'm, I'm, I'm caused to think that, that Christians today, we have a very similar question we have to answer. A very similar question. That question is this. How do we... How do we live in a world that is so impure without becoming impure ourselves? Have you wondered about that? How do we live in a world that is so impure without being affected by that, without becoming impure ourselves? How can we be shrouded in all kinds of depravity, in all kinds of sin, and manage to keep ourselves unspotted from that? We know because we read in our Bible that we serve a God that prizes purity. He loves purity. He wants purity. He says in Psalm 24 and verse 4 that the people who can ascend to His holy hill are the people who have what? They have pure what? They have pure hands. And we read in other places in our Bible that we serve a Lord, we serve a God that prizes purity. In James 1 and verse 27, the Bible says, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. In 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 14, Peter would write this, Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by Him in peace, spotless and blameless. Spotless and blameless. And so when God talks about what He wants for us, He uses words like pure. He uses words like unspotted. He uses words like blameless and spotless and unblemished. We serve a God that prizes purity, yet we also know, we also know with all the certainty in the world that we live in a world that is remarkably un impure. And we also know that we're influenced by our surroundings, don't we? What did Paul write and tell the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33? Evil company does what? <laughs> 
It corrupts good morals. Evil company corrupts good morals. And what do we teach, what do we teach our kids at every single youth-themed event in one way or another? Proverbs 4.23, right? Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. There's another proverb that speaks to that, Proverbs 22, Proverbs 22, in verses 24 through 25, where the Bible says, Do not associate with a man given to anger, or you will learn his ways. We live in an impure world, and we are influenced by our surroundings. And now, if you're like me, you look at, you look at those, th- those three truths that we just looked at, that God wants us to be pure, that this world is impure, and we are influenced by our surroundings. You look at those three truths, you add those together, and if you're like me, you think this. I need to buy a cabin on a lake in the middle of nowhere with no TV and internet access and live off the land. I need to get out of the world. I need to get away from all this depravity so that I'm not influenced by it. But at the same time, at the same time, Paul would say this in 1 Corinthians 5 verses 9 through 10, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not mean with the immoral people of this world or with the covetous and swindlers or with idolaters, for then you would have to go out of the world. So Paul says, Paul says, I don't want you to go out of the world. I don't want you to leave civilization behind. You got to stay here. And so it seems that a Christian finds themselves in the ultimate catch-22. How can I, how can I be in the world, but not of the world? You ever thought about that? How can I be in this world and not be of this world? How can I go to public school and be surrounded by, by a bunch of kids who aren't interested in doing, doing what's right, who are just interested in, in rebelling against their parents and doing things that are wrong and disrespecting their teachers. How can I be around all that and stay pure myself? How can I go to USF and be surrounded by atheists and pantheists and all the other ists and not be influenced by that? How can I go to work around a bunch of people who don't care anything about purity and not become like that myself? How can I watch TV or surf the web and be bombarded by sensual images without even trying and not be influenced by that? How can I be in the world, but not of the world? Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. I think that discussion is a huge discussion. I think it is multifaceted and very complex, this question of how can I be in the world and of the world? And I I think there's part of me that thinks I should have preached this as a series, but, but I think there are some good thoughts that were given in Ephesians chapter 5. Some good thoughts that I'd like to discuss with you tonight about how we can live in a world that is so impure without becoming impure ourselves. Ephesians 5, Ephesians 5, start reading with me in verse 1 where the Bible says this, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. In those verses we're told to try our best to be imitators of God, to be pure and holy like him. And in the verses that follow in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul is going to give us three ideas, three ideas, three things we need to do to make sure that while we're living in this impure world, we aren't influenced by that. Three ideas that help us be in this world, but not of this world. And that's what I'd like to talk with you about this evening. Three things. And the first thing is this. If we're going to be in this world, but not be of this world, Paul says we're going to need a zero-tolerance policy. We're going to need a zero-tolerance policy. Look and and read with me in Ephesians 5. Start reading with me in verse 3. Ephesians 5 and verse 3, where the Bible says this, But immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks." For this you know with certainty, that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and 
God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. In those verses, Paul uses, Paul uses some extremely strong language. He, he, he tells us that these things that he mentions here in these four verses, these things are not simply unsavory. They are not simply unfortunate. They're not something that we should minimize or limit. They are things that are anathema to God, and they are things that should be intolerable to Christians. In verse 3, verse 3, he says, these kinds of things must not even be named among you. The Holy Spirit says, I don't want you doing that. I don't even want you talking about that. In verse 4, he says, there must be none of this. There must be none of this impurity. Don't minimize it. Get rid of all of it. Let there be none of it. In verse 5, he says, for this you know with certainty. You know with certainty. You can be assured. You are convinced of your mind that the people who practice these kinds of things, they don't have an inheritance in the kingdom of God. The people who are willing to be impure. If you're going to be impure in this world, don't let anyone convince you of anything differently. You are convinced that you won't have that precious inheritance that Paul wrote so beautifully about in the beginning of this letter. And he says something, he says something else in verse 6 that I think is important to mention. He says, let no one deceive you with empty words. He says, don't let anyone come along in this world, whether religious or non-religious, don't let anyone come along in this world and convince you that you're going to be all right. That you're going to be all right tolerating a little bit of impurity in your life. And, and the fact that he says that, the fact that he wants to warn them about that, that they're going to be deceived, says to us that people really are going to come and they're really going to start telling them, don't worry about those little bits of impurity. Don't worry about those things in your life. You're, you're going to be just fine. You'll be able to keep an inheritance while you keep that impurity in your life. He says, don't let yourself be deceived by that. Those are empty words. He says, you know with certainty. That those who tolerate impurity will not have that inheritance. Paul says if we're going to be in the world but not of the world, we need a zero tolerance policy. Because the second, the second we tolerate any impurity, we become impure ourselves. And, and, and give me a moment. Give me a moment to talk to you about the word impure. I mean to talk to you about the word tolerate. You know what it means to tolerate something? It means to live with it. It means to let it stay with you. It means to put up with it. When I think about the word tolerate, I think about, I think about a toothache, right? I'm not really happy that it's there, but I'm not doing anything about it this week, right? To tolerate something is to put up with it, to let it live, to let it stay, even if you don't like it. And that's the, exactly the kind of attitude Paul says we can't have. We can't have towards these impure things in the world. He says, do not tolerate it. Do not let it live. Do not let it stay. Now, let me be clear that I am not saying, I'm not saying by any means that if you ever slip up, if you ever make a mistake, if you ever do something wrong, you're toast. I'm not saying that at all. But what I'm saying is when we find impurity in ourselves, when we see that impurity in us, any degree of that impurity, we need to have a zero tolerance policy. We need to make sure that it doesn't stay in us, that it doesn't live in us, that when I find some kind of impurity inside of myself, I need to kick it out. I need to get it out of me. Because if I let that impurity stay inside of me, not only am I impure, but I grow worse and worse and worse day by day. You see, sin and impurity, it's not, it's not like a toothache. Sin and impurity is a lot like cancer. It's something that grows worse and worse and worse. Just like cancer, just like cancer, impurity is always progressive. It always grows. It's always malignant. And so we don't treat the impurity that we find in ourselves like a toothache. We don't put up with it and let it stay and just deal with it with it's there. We deal with it like it's a cancer. We cut it out as soon as we find it. We don't let it get any worse than it already is. Paul says if you're going to be in this world, but not of this world, you need a zero tolerance policy. When you find it, 
Get rid of it. Don't tolerate it. Do you have a zero tolerance policy? Do you have a zero tolerance policy for immorality? Do you have a zero tolerance policy for greed? Do you have a zero tolerance policy for filthiness? Do you have a zero tolerance policy for coarse jesting? Do you have a zero tolerance policy for immorality? Do you allow any degree of that to stay in your life, to stick around? If we expect to be in this world but not of this world, we can't tolerate any impurity. We need a zero tolerance policy. If we find it, we need to get rid of it. But Paul would also make this point next. If we expect, if we expect to be in this world but not of this world, he would add this point to the met this point to the mix, he would say, you need, you need shameless peculiarity. Look at what he says in Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, starting in verse 7, where Paul would write this to the church in Ephesus. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you, for, you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For all the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. In verse 7, Paul tells, us, Paul tells us that we need to make sure that we are not partakers with the evil in this world. And in verse 8, he says, he says that we are children of light. And we've heard that so many times. That's what we're compared to. We're compared to light in the world. Something that is fundamentally, foundationally different from darkness. Something that shines. Something that stands out. Paul tells us that we're different. We're peculiar. In fact, that's exactly the word that Peter will use to describe us in 1 Peter chapter 2 in verse 9. He will say, in the King James Version, he will say, you are a peculiar people. And I think that word peculiar, I really hate the negative press that it gets. We use the word peculiar in such a negative way that, that if you're peculiar, you're some kind of oddball, you're a weirdo that no one really likes. You're, you're peculiar. Can I, tell you, can I tell you the word peculiar? We, we don't give it the due that it deserves. That, you know where that word comes from, peculiar? It comes from the Latin word for cattle. Cattle are marked. They are branded with a unique mark to indicate that they belong to a particular person. And in the mid-15th century, the word peculiar literally meant belonging exclusively to one person. And that's why Peter calls us peculiar. Peter calls us peculiar because, because as Christians, we belong exclusively to God. As Christians, we have been branded with a unique mark. A mark that sets us apart from the rest of the world. And you know what that mark is? It's our purity. That's the brand that we have. That's the mark that we have that separates us from other people. We are a peculiar people. As Paul will point out in Ephesians 5, Ephesians 5 and verse 9, the fruit of the light consists of all goodness and righteousness and truth. Christians belong to God. Christians are pure. And that, that means Christians are different. If we're going to be in this world but not of this world, there's a fundamental truth that we have to accept about life as a Christian. And that is this, that impurity is mundane, but godliness is unique. You have to understand that. We have to understand that. We have to embrace that truth, that impurity is mundane and godliness is unique. It stands out just by virtue of itself. If you intend to be pure, you're going to stick out like a sore thumb in this world. It's unavoidable. There is no way to be who God wants you to be in this world without the world noticing that you aren't like them. We stick out. We are peculiar. Peculiar. 
And here's the point. Here's the point. If you expect to stay pure, if you expect to be in this world, but not of this world, you can't be scared of that. We can't be ashamed of the fact that we're different. If I expect to be in this world, but not of this world, I've got to be all right praying, praying a prayer in a crowded restaurant. And I've got to be okay praying a prayer in a restaurant with only a few pa- patrons where everyone, everyone can hear every word I'm saying. I've got to be okay with that. If I expect to be in this world, but not of this world, I've got to be all right with my coworkers knowing I don't watch Game of Thrones and I'm not going to start. If I'm going to be in this world but not of this world, I can't be afraid to let my friends know that I'm not going to do that thing. I'm not going to go to that place. I'm not going to participate in that activity. And I've got to be all right telling them why. If I'm going to be in this world but not of this world, I've got to embrace. Not not, not showboat. Not brag. Not boast. Not be arrogant. But I've got to embrace the fact that I am not like this world. I've got to be okay with that. The only way, the only way to truly blend in in this world is to compromise our purity. Because, because when we try, when we try to serve Jesus and when we try to look, look like everybody else, the second we try to strike that balance, what we've done is we've started serving two masters. And what did Jesus say we would do if we started serving two masters? We're going to hate one and love the other or despise one and serve the other. We're not going to be able to serve both masters. I can't serve Jesus in conformity. And if my intention is to look like the rest of this world, if I'm, if I'm too scared to look different than the people in this world, I'm going to instantly start compromising my purity so that, I, so that I don't stick out. If I'm going to be in this world but not of this world, I've got to make sure, I've got to make sure that I have shameless peculiarity. You're different. And we have to be okay with that. Paul would say this finally. If I'm going to be in this world but not of this world, that's going, to require, that's going to require bold opposition. That's going to require bold opposition. Look at what, look at what he writes, in, starting in verse 11 of Ephesians chapter 5. Paul would say this, Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. Paul tells us in these verses that it is our job as Christians to make sure that we do not participate, that we do not participate. He says, I don't want you to be a part of it, but, but you can't stop there. You have to take that one step further. Not only just don't participate, you have to make sure you go out of your way to expose the impurity and the darkness that you find in this world. You have to stand in bold opposition to the impurity that you find. Paul says that our job as Christians is to expose. Our job is to shine as a light on ungodly behavior and help this world, help the lost of this world understand what ungodly behavior is. He tells us, he tells us in verse 12 that it is disgraceful to even speak of the things that are done by them in secret, but it is part of our job to make sure they understand that the things that they're doing in secret are disgraceful, that they are not okay. And he tells us in verse 13 that we are light and it is our job to shine a light, to expose sin for what it is in this world. Now, I'll tell you what that doesn't mean. That doesn't mean that it's my job to become a park bench preacher. Every spring, every spring on Lamar University's campus, we had, we had park bench preachers come to campus. And what these guys did is they got into the middle of the quad and they stood up on a park bench and they started pointing at people and saying, you're evil. You're evil. You're doing this wrong. You're condemned. You're going to hell. That's what they would do. And, and honestly, they drew a crowd of kids who would just laugh at them. But that is not what we mean. That is not what Paul is intending for us to do when he says we're supposed to expose the darkness of the world. He's not saying, I need you to become a park bench preacher who just condemns everybody. That's not what he's saying. 
He's saying our job is to pull the lost of this world aside and with love, gentleness, and transparency, show them. Show them that they've been caught in the devil's snare. Show them, show them what they can do to get out of the devil's snare. Show them how God wants them to be pure with love and gentle care. We need to make sure that we are boldly opposed Boldly opposed to the impurity we find, this, find in this world if we expect to be in this world but not of this world. You know, I think one of the mistakes that I'm prone to making, and you can, you can join me in this too. You can confess this too if you want. I'm going to confess this to you right now. One of the mistakes that I make in this world sometimes is that I see impurity as something that I simply need to avoid. I see it as something that I simply need to avoid. I look at sin and I look at evil in this world and I say, I just need to make sure that I don't do that. I just need to make sure that I dodge all of Satan's temptations. And that's my job. Just get out of the way, hide from sin, and make sure he doesn't get me. And yes, it is true that sin and impurity need to be avoided. But I'll tell you this this evening. If all we're trying to do as Christians is dodge sin, we're doing it wrong. We're doing it halfway. I know some people who have taken that tack. Some people who have looked, who have looked at the world and, and, and have taken it upon themselves, they see their job as simply to avoid sin, to not commit sin themselves. And so what they'll do is they'll see someone who's engaged, who's engaged in doing something wrong, something that, that might even cost them their soul, and they'll sit back, they'll sit back in a corner, and they'll say this to themselves. They'll say, you know what, you know what, I don't really think that's right, but that's between them and God. I really don't think that's, wrong, that's right, but, but, but you know, God's the one who judges, not me, so I'm not going to say anything about it. They'll say, you know, I'm looking at what they're doing, and, and I wouldn't do it, and I wouldn't want my kids to do it, but that's their choice. That's not mine. And when that's the attitude we have toward the impurity that we see in the world, all we're doing, all we're doing is trying to avoid sin. And we're falling short of what God wants us to be. Because the truth is, if all we're trying to do is dodge sin, we're doing it wrong. Because the Bible tells us in so many different ways, especially here in Ephesians chapter 5, that my job, my job toward impurity, that impurity should not be avoided. It should rather be confronted. That impurity is not something that I just hide from. It's something that I go to battle with every single day I set foot out of my house. That's the mindset I need to have. The mindset I need to take with me to work every day. The mindset I need to take with me to school every day. The mindset I need to take with me to the grocery store every day. That I'm not just hiding from sin. I'm fighting it. Paul says our job, in Ephesians 5, he says our job is to expose it. To show the world what it really is. Paul in 2 Corinthians 10 and verses 3 through 5 would say this, these beautiful words, 2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 through 5, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. You see, my job is not just to hide from sin. My job is to go out there and use the truth, use the knowledge of God that I've been given, and actively fight against it. One chapter over in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul is going to tell us to put on the armor of God, and do not forget that one of the pieces of the armor he gives us is an offensive weapon. If we are going to be in this world, but not be of this world, impurity is not something we simply avoid. It is something we confront, something we fight against. I'm going to need to make sure I wake up every day, wake up every day fighting for the promotion of holiness in myself and in the people that I meet. I think about that fire that we started by talking about, that fire in Texas. And you know what the people in that plant didn't do whenever that fire broke out? You know what they didn't do is they didn't sound the siren, evacuate everybody, and run for the hills. They didn't do that at all. Because they knew if they did that, if we sent everybody home and just evacuated the plant and just let it burn, you know what's going to happen? It's going to explode. And then that black cloud that everyone's worried about, it's going to become exponentially larger. 
And the problem we're, we have on our hands is going to become even worse. If all we do is hide, the impurity spreads. No, they didn't run for the hills. You know what they did? They sent firefighters who controlled the blaze, who minimized the damage, and who eventually extinguished the fire. And that's what we have to be as well. If we're going to be in this world... To boldly oppose impurity wherever we encounter it. Because we don't just hide from it. We confront it. We fight it. We shine a light on it and expose it for what it is. With as much love and gentleness and transparency as we can muster. We need to make sure that we are boldly opposed to the impurity that we find. That's how we can be in this world. But not of this world. And above all else, I need to remember... I need to remember where purity truly comes from. I need to remember that I am not pure. I am not pure because I am good. That I am pure because Christ is good. And because we have been washed with His blood in baptism. As 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18 tells us, knowing you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished, and spotless. The blood of Christ. I'm not pure because I'm good. I'm pure because Christ is good. And I'm pure because I came to Him for the cleansing that He can provide. And He can make you pure as well. He can make you pure. If you have never been baptized for remission of your sins, the Bible says that if you believe in Him, are willing to repent of those sins and confess His name before men, He will You can be baptized in water and have your sins washed away and be pure in His sight. Or maybe you have done that, but you've realized you've let a little sin creep into your life. Your zero tolerance policy hasn't been quite what it needed to be. The Bible tells us that if we're faithful to confess our sins and ask for forgiveness and repent of those sins, He's faithful to cleanse us all over again. If we can help you be pure in this impure world in any way, Please let us help you. Please come to the front right now while we stand and while we